wrócić do Warszawy po tylu lat nieobecności tu. I przepraszam z góry, że muszę po angielsku speak, because my um, Polish has gotten a little rusty after many years outside of Warsaw. That's a gap I hope to um, rectify in the next few years. But in the meantime, please forgive me. One week ago, President Trump spoke at Platz Kraszynskich and gave the best foreign policy address of his presidency. He spoke of a community of nations, an alliance of countries united by values, among those values the rule of law, freedom of expression, freedom of speech. He spoke of a strong alliance of free nations. He spoke of a strong Europe. He then mentioned that Russia was acting in Ukraine and other ways as a destabilizing factor in the world and therefore reaffirmed America's Article 5 commitment to Poland and to all the other NATO members. As I said, I think this was the best foreign policy speech of President Trump's new presidency. He reaffirmed, in essence, America's commitment to the free world. The free world is sometimes termed the liberal world order, but I really don't like that phrase, the liberal world order, because there are many people who don't describe themselves as liberals who belong in it, not outside it. I, like the, I prefer the free world. And in recommitting the United States to the free world, President Trump was following a centuries-old tradition in the West. In Europe, the notion of a just international order rooted in transnational values is at least as old as Erasmus. Immanuel Kant elaborated a theory of perpetual peace between states committed to the rule of law and republican values. As my country, as America, emerged as a world power at the end of the 19th century, we developed our own American grand strategy, our version of the free world. We thought of ourselves as distinct from the European empires and spheres of influence of the time. In contrast, America sought an open rules-based world, more just and simultaneously more profitable for ourselves and for others, because we Americans recognized that our interests, our prosperity, and our security were tied to the prosperity and security of other nations. We believe that the advanced democracies of the world should set the global agenda along the lines of this vision an objective ambitious but also generous because we understood America's national interest in broad, not narrow terms. In his memoirs, Kurier z Warszawy, Jan Nowak Jezerański writes of astonishment at American humanitarian assistance to Poland in 1920 and wondered what sort of nation helped others and asked nothing for itself. But America understood that as we helped others, we in fact advanced our own interests because America could not do good business with poor countries. We wanted to make the world a better place so we could all get rich. That was our American ambition and confidence. My nation developed the outlines of this grand strategy starting in 1900 but my country failed to apply it in the 1930s when Europe needed us most. Our failure was costly, nowhere more so than in Poland. But after 1945, recognizing our failure, we set out with what was left of Europe to build the free world. We contained Stalin's Soviet Union and rebuilt Western Europe. We established great institutions, NATO and what became the European Union, to make the new peace lasting. The achievements of the free world inspired the dissidents of Soviet-occupied Europe. 
including core in Solidarność to Polsce. And the people of Central Europe and Poland took down the Iron Curtain in 1989. In the early 1990s, as America contemplated our options, wise polls from right to left made the case that the principles of the free world apply to all of Europe. Polls asked us, rhetorically, whether, the, whether freedom was limited to Europe west of the line that Stalin drew, to which there was and is only one honorable answer. Thus inspired, NATO and Europe grew to embrace 100 million Europeans from the Baltic to the Black Sea. The free world worked, and Europe has enjoyed the longest period of peace, prosperity, and democratic governance in its history. And the one element I would have added to Donald Trump's speech, if I had been asked, was to recognize all that Poland has accomplished in the generation since 1989. I'm not a Pole but it is possible to argue that this was the best generation in Poland's history since King Stefan Batory. That may be right. But if this achievement was so profound, what has gone so wrong? What accounts for current doubts and skepticism? What accounts for Brexit and the rise of national populism in Europe and in some parts of America? I would say this by way of explanation or attempted interpretation. First, economic stresses, even in successful Poland. The West in general has suffered through years of economic distortion, slow growth, high unemployment in much of Europe, and in America, levels of income inequality not seen in almost 100 years. Add to this pressure the challenge of national identity in the face of high immigration. Latino in the United States, Middle East, North African in Europe, Eastern Europe in some parts of the UK, and immigration traditionally generates nativist reactions in both Europe and America. I say this without approval, but there it is. The United States and the EU seem to have fallen short in response. American political institutions often seem paralyzed by partisanship and many Europeans seem alienated from the EU's institutions, a sort of democratic deficit on both sides of the Atlantic. In this period of unease, Russia has resumed its role as corrosive political spoiler, maligned by intention, using propaganda, corrupt funding, and other active measures updated for the cyber age. Moscow's aim seems to be the same as in Soviet times, to weaken the West's institutions and discredit Western values, thus shielding Moscow's despotic system from liberal influence and easing Russia's domination of its neighbors, Ukraine first of all. The free world order is being challenged by another vision, a new nationalism, which rejects in principle the objectives of an open rules-based world led by the world's great democracies. Some of the new nationalists seem to regard values as an indulgence and prefer pol power politics and spheres of influence. They call on the power of the nationalist idea, and that idea does have a dark power. No need to tell Poles about the consequences of such a vision if it were to succeed. In place of the free world order, we would have great powers dominating their neighbors, unchallenged, arguing and fighting over their respective spheres of influence and crushing rebellions from within. I cannot understand why anyone would advocate a return, in effect, to pre-1914 Europe or 1930s Asia, throwing away lessons it took millions of lives to learn. What then must we do, we who defend and seek to advance the free world? First, immediate business. Turn back Russian aggression. Defend Ukraine and help Ukraine defend itself. Maintain sanctions. Intensify pressure on Moscow to settle and not prolong the conflict. And at the same time, push the Ukrainians to advance their own reforms. Resist Russian infiltration and leverage. 
We need to deal with Russian propaganda, cyber aggression, energy leverage, and all manner of hybrid threats. Engage Russia and the Russians. The Trump administration may seek, as did the Bush and Obama administrations, to develop a positive agenda with Russia. This can be useful if we do not expect too much and if we avoid paying the Russians extra for cooperation. And we should reach out not just to the Russian government. We must not forget those Russians who have a better vision for their country. Dealing with Russia may be the easy part. We must also advance a transatlantic growth and jobs agenda. The free world order needs to deliver economically for its people and for the world. Closing economies is a loser's game. But open trade needs to be matched by pro-growth pro investment and other pro-growth policies. We must also challenge the new nationalism with a new patriotism. The nation and the nation state will remain fundamental. Americans will not give it up. Poles and others in Central Europe who have just regained their sovereignty, I suspect, will defend it. So will many in Western Europe. But the nation state and the good of the nation state is not an ultimate end. And its inter the interests of the nation state are not the highest. In the Western tradition, tyrannical and aggressive rulers lose legitimacy and governments gain it as they act in accordance with universal principles. Nations and governments are answerable to those principles. Thus, we embrace the France of liberté, égalité, fraternité, and we find compelling the slogan of Polish patriots, Zawaszą i naszą wolność. The West needs to make room for patriotism bound to higher principles. That is the West, and that is the Western tradition. We may also need to find ways to open the nation, understanding it along cultural and linguistic, not only ethnic tribal terms. My country, America, is founded on a principle that all men are created equal. And as Lincoln said, Immigrants to America become Americans as they accept this principle. This open American definition of nationality may have something to teach. British identity as being a British person is in principle cultural and transnational. So is the French civic definition of nationality. This is not easy as America's painful history shows. But the free world must challenge this, this century's new nationalism, which is in many ways just a cheap remake of the 20th century original with a better patriotism. A strong, confident Europe based on the nation state properly conceived, tied to Europeans, may yet emerge. In the end, we who believe in the free world must believe in ourselves and our values as Poles believed in themselves and their values in the darkest days of martial law. Among those values, our interests are best served as our values advance. These values include the rule of law at home and a rules-based world, human rights and democracy, and the prosperity they can generate. A strong state with strong institutions, both independent and rooted in law, remains fundamental. Free nations' interests advance or decline together. The nation state, even the free world, are not ends in themselves, but earn legitimacy as they serve these higher purposes. And finally, the world's great democracies must lead together to these ends. For if we do not lead, the world will be led by the world's great autocracies who are waiting like a demon crouching at the door. We must rule over them. Let us rediscover our faith in these ideas, the best of the West, 
and act to preserve, defend, and extend our legacy. Thank you. Okay, um, let's open the floor to questions and answers. Zapraszam. There's a question. Thank you, Dan. This was fantastic. Michał Baranowski, I'm at GMF Warsaw. Um, Thank you so much for your speech and for your writing and for all your service. You know that you have only friends here and, uh, and it's always so fantastic to hear you. My, I, I wanted to ask you about um, the debate inside the US that we, <laughs> we are seeing sometimes through uh, reading important speeches uh, within you know, debates within the body politic. And uh, especially wanted to ask you about the vision of Europe Hall, free and at peace. I mean, this was a vision that guided your work. Uh, this was a vision that, you know, that, uh, that was incredibly important to, to our part of the world, but it not, it's, it's, it's not a done deal by far. I wanted to ask you, you know, how, is this vision still there in the United States? Uh, in the current administration and the level of support you see for it at the highest level of, of, uh, of, uh, of the government and, and, and really um, you know, the, the courage for implementation of this difficult, difficult vision. All right, thanks. Uh. Wyjaśnienie naszej polityki wewnętrznej. No okay. Będę się starał. When Poles think of the American right, they generally think of Ronald Reagan. And they love it. With, with good reason. Ronald Reagan absolutely understand, understood two big things, that communism was evil and communism would fail. And Ronald Reagan believed in democracy. He believed in the American grand strategy as I laid it out, which is not just Woodrow Wilson, it's also Teddy Roosevelt and Ronald Reagan and Harry Truman But there is another American right that Poles do not remember, which is the American right of isolationism, of the wrong way to interpret America first. And there are people in the Trump administration who recall that bad tradition Taka tradycja, która doprowadziła nas do 1 i 17 września 1939 roku. All right, I'm not proud of that tradition. But for that reason, I was all the more happy to hear what President Trump said at Platz Kraczynski. Because he did speak of, a, of an alliance of free nations rooted in values. That is important. I can, we can work with that and build on it. There is another vision, but I would prefer to work with what we've got. I remember in 1989, someone describing Mazowiecki's tactics as a negotiator during the round table, Mazowiecki and Goremek. They would be confronted with a, a brick wall by the, the communists with a tiny crack in it. And all they focused on was the crack. And pretty soon the wall disappeared. That was told to me by one of the Poles in, 
admiration of their negotiating skills, really out-negotiating the communists. For Poland, well, Poland was a co-author of the strategy of a Europe whole, free, and at peace. It wasn't just born in Washington. Poles were influential. Lech Wałęsa's trip to the Congress and his speech that began Mi Narod. He and his team had a lot to do with it. What, therefore, I suspect that the current Polish government can, and maybe they did, encourage Trump to move in a good direction. And so, if so, I applaud them. Always with the Americans, it takes some work. But Polish diplomacy at its most skillful is good at moving us in the right direction in the interests of both nations properly understood. Okay? I, that's the best I can do for you. Keep at it. Mariusz Antonowicz, Vilnius University, Lithuania. Do you see any role as a mediator, as uh, someone who pressurizes uh, for the United States uh, in uh, mending uh, regional, uh, let's say, uh, regional tensions uh, in Eastern Central Europe, for instance, Polish-Ukrainian or Polish-Lithuanian relations? Do you see any role that the U.S. could play there or is it just a bystander waiting for those countries to do their job? Thank you. Druga dobre pytanie, łatwe pytanie. The United States is not and cannot be some kind of imperial power. The Polish government will do what it sees in its interests. What we can do as Americans, both in government and without, is articulate the broadest possible vision. Every country, including my own, has its dark spots. You either overcome them or they eat you alive. It is important to remember what it is we set out to achieve together in 1989. And it was not a return to the 1930s with everybody's nationalism competing with everybody else's. Look, I have nothing to say on the subject of what signs should be posted where in what language on roads and how subjects in schools should be organized. That's, that's not our role. But if America has any role at all, it is to hold up the flame of a vision of an undivided Europe of values and of the place of all the nations in that system of values. Um, all right, Ukraine. It's got its history and it's got its problems. And it has also got a problem that it's being attacked by Russia, which has invaded it. The most hopeful sign I have seen about Ukraine's development of its national identity has been the multinational character of the, Ma of the Euromaidan. And I'll tell you a story. You may remember in May 2016, uh, the Eurovision Song Contest was won by a Ukrainian, but not just a Ukrainian, it was a Crimean Tartar, a Muslim woman, who sang about the Crimean Tartars and their suffering in Tartar, the Tartar language. And she won for Ukraine, and that day on the Maidan, there was a demonstration celebrating this Ukrainian victory. And I thought to myself, I was there, I was in Kyiv, and I thought to myself, ah, the Ukrainian national identity is beginning to crystallize in a multinational, open rather than closed nationalist form. This is good news. 
And that may give the Ukrainian space to deal with the darker spots of their own history the way every country has to deal with the darker spots in its history. I guess neighbors should give neighbors and friends should give friends the space to do that. Easier said than done. But the role for my government and our role for a long time, for the last generation, has been to uphold these values and then hope other countries work together. So the short answer is neither of the two extremes you pose, but we should elevate, we should, we should elevate the discussion as best we can. Thank you very much. I am Javid Veliev from Azerbaijan. Uh, my question is about Trump foreign policy regarding the South Caucasus. We have seen that during the 19th, the Russian first policy and energy projects played an important role for the Clinton South Caucasus policy. During the Bush administration, security, Afghanistan, operation and Iran-Western relations have negative or positive effects on U.S. South Caucasus policy during Obama administration, democracy promotion, or Turkey-Armenian uh, relations have negative or positive relations on U.S. South Caucasus policy. What do you uh, evaluation about Trump uh, South Caucasus uh, policy in near future? Uh. Do you do he has any policy regarding the South Caucasus? Um, I think the Trump administration's policy toward this part of Europe is a work in progress. I think that his visit here was a good step forward. I'm encouraged by it. I hope we play an active role. I think that the Obama administration was not as active as it should have been in this part of the world. I think that we made a mistake of taking Europe for granted a little bit. But after the Russian invasion of Crimea and the attack on the Donbass, the Obama administration turned and changed its policy and led NATO's decision of the Warsaw NATO summit to move troops into the Baltics, Poland, and Romania. Um, so that was late, but this time not too late. I hope the Trump administration continues the policy of building a Europe whole, free, and at peace. I think the, Trump, the Trump's visit here was a good step in that direction. It will take a tremendous amount of effort, but it will also take efforts in countries like yours. Um, we can't fix the issues of building a nation all by ourselves. We can do what we can do. Um, I think the Trump administration is going to take a little while longer to get fully organized. Um, I say this without approval, but there we are. Um, so keep working with us and recognize, I, I hope you recognize that the Trump speech gave us something to work with. Hello, um, my name is Mateusz Zagadłowicz. I'm a student of international relations here in Mosul. Um, I've read a book of George Friedman, Next 100 Years. He, he's a founder of uh, Stratfor. And uh, have you read it? And what's your thoughts about uh, possibilities for Poland for next 100 years? Is it possible to be a, a power in this side of the world? Um, I have not read the book, but, um, okay, is it possible for Poland to be a power? Uh, yes. Um, Poland has had been increasing its weight in Europe. Now, I consider this to be a good thing because I think Polish views on the questions I care the most about, that is, a strong Europe, um, independence from Russia, a better Russia, support for an independent Ukraine are all good things. 
I think for Poland to realize um, its potential as a first-tier European country, it's got to find the balance between advancing its own national interests and doing so working through a strong Europe, uh, which means working with Germany, uh, working with the EU post-Brexit, working with the United States. A weak and divided European Union does nothing for anybody, as far as I can tell, except for Vladimir Putin. It helps him. Um, the Poland sometimes makes the case that Europe needs to be more responsive to middle-sized countries to the interests of the European nations like Poland that have recently regained their sovereignty. I get that. I understand that. There's a case to be made. And Europe post-Brexit may have to enter into a period of reforms. I don't mind the notion of a Europe of nations. But weakening the European Union is not the way forward. Um, I have found Polish diplomacy to be quite skilled. And it seems to me that a nation which understands its interest in broad terms rather than narrow terms is apt to be more successful in the end. So I hope that Poland follows the path it's been on for the past generation of, of realizing its perfectly legitimate national aspirations through a strong Europe and through a strong NATO and working with the United States all at the same time. Also, in my country, the Sprawa Polska, the Polish cause, has been bipartisan. Democrats and Republicans, when, when we put together the political coalition to get Poland into NATO, it was, it was the Clinton administration, and we couldn't have done it without the Republicans. And when President George W. Bush wanted to bring the Baltics into NATO, he was a Republican, and we couldn't have done it without the Democrats. I would, the, my one tactical advice to the Polish government would be never make yourselves a partisan object in American domestic politics. You should be everybody's friend if they're your friend. And Poland's got plenty of friends. Um, hello, my name is Georgi Sibirtsev. I'm a lecturer at Voronezh State University, Russian Federation. So I um, uh, would like to uh, ask you to clarify, you, you tell several words about the European values. And um, so I think firstly it's uh, human rights, that's the main European values. And that's why I'm actually tr ask you to clarify how do you think what um, uh, what do you think about the situation with refugees in the Europe when Hungary builds a wall to protect their territory from the refugees when Poland takes only 9,000 9, uh, people of refugees and said that they don't want more when uh, Macron uh, said in several weeks ago about the uh, sanctions about, uh, against the Poland. So, uh, can we say that right now Central Europe has the uh, the same uh, uh, the same uh, the same uh, um, thoughts about the European values? Thank you. Well, as an American, what can I possibly say about policies that are skeptical of immigration? given the position, given our, my country's last presidential campaign in which the Trump campaign was extraordinarily skeptical, if not hostile, to Latino immigration. Kim jestem, żeby krytykować inny kraj, biorąc pod uwagę polityki wobec imigrantów w moim kraju? I would say this. First of all, that's a difficult and painful issue. And it is the reaction among European countries to the hundreds of thousands of refugees 
was bound to be mixed, both humanitarian and sympathetic, and both concerned on security grounds and other grounds. I don't think anyone in Europe would honestly say that European Union policies toward immigration had been splendid. I think they had done the best they could under very difficult circumstances, and I, and I just don't feel I can criticize them. I think that a successful European Union policy on immigration will have to involve elements of protection of the borders, hard security, a way of vetting people, long-term help for countries that are trying to stabilize themselves. Good luck with finding a Syria policy. It is awful and tragic. So I don't know what, I don't think anyone, any government would argue that they found the right answer. But it's not for me to criticize. I don't like some of the nativist politics, but that goes for my own government. Now, since you're from the Russian Federation, I'm going to answer a question you didn't ask, but I'll do it anyway. There is the view that Russia is somehow civilizationally doomed to be authoritarian, to be an autocracy and not European. I don't believe that. I don't believe that at all. I think Russia has gone between periods, I think the, the, the Slavophile versus Westerner divide in Russia is real, but I also think that Russia's most successful periods have been periods where it has ref started on the path of internal reform and modernization. And I think Russia is as capable as any other country of developing higher standards of democracy and good governance. And for that reason, I find the current Russian position to be doubly tragic because I don't believe it's inevitable. I believe Russia could be otherwise. I think if it weren't for the Russian Revolution, Russia would have succeeded I, I've, in, in developing itself according to European standards. I can't prove that. But I don't believe in the Sam Huntington thesis of civilizational divides. I think that's too reductionist. I think it doesn't leave enough space for actual history and for political leadership. And therefore, I believe that we should look to a better future with a Russia that is different. And I don't believe that the current Russia is the only possible Russia. You didn't ask that question, so I don't ask you to comment. But I wanted to make clear that my views of Russia's current policy are not a prognosis for Russia's inevitable future. One more question again. Um, there's a question for me uh, about Belarus. Is there any possibility for the West how to relieve the Belarus, how to make Belarus more democratic? Is there any kind of strategy that make... Because uh, here on the University of Warsaw, we have many students from Belarus. They are open-minded, but how to make Belarus more democratic? less Russian, yeah. but more European? Um, well, what I say to my Polish friends when we have this discussion is, welcome to our side of the line. Now you know exactly the kinds of problems we faced dealing with Europe during the Cold War. How do you do something that seems impossible? 
And I guess the way you do it is to be patient, but also determined. In policymaking, you have to be realistic about what is possible in any given year or at any given moment. But don't elevate realism to the status of a doctrine. Because when you do that, you usually write off countries. It's impossible. The Iron Curtain will never fall. The Berlin Wall is there forever. Be realistic. If we, were, if, we devoted, if we elevated realism to a doctrine, we never would have supported solidarity. But if you try to do too much too soon, you'll fail. So work with Belarus, with Belarus, be patient, be determined, do the work to help Belarus and wait for better times because those times may come and then you'll be ready. That's not a satisfying answer, but you know, I, sometimes you just have to stick to it and be patient. Professor Teimuras Babaskiri from Tbilisi State University, Georgia. Uh, Mr. Fried, you have several times mentioned today that uh, uh, Russia has invaded Ukraine, but uh, I was uh, like looking for uh, also that you would uh, add Georgia also to, to the list of the invasion of Russian invasion. And uh, I have uh, uh, just uh, one question in this case whether I, you uh, gave an interview to uh, Georgian uh, station uh, and said that I do not think that even after the Russian-Georgian war we reali realized how seriously Russia was going to use force to stop the accession of its neighbors and institutions of free world. Uh, when the situation in Crimea was uh, the, uh, quickly uh, deteriorating, when the Russians were deploying the troops hiddenly, like they did in Georgia in 2008. Why did the Rus uh, American administration did not think that it was the beginning of new full-scale invasion? Why? Um, well, I won't forget the Russo-Georgian War. I was Assistant Secretary of State for European Affairs during the war. I was with Condi Rice in Tbilisi when President Saakashvili signed the six-point ceasefire. So I, I remember that. <clears throat> the, what we succeeded in doing for Georgia is supporting the economy after the war so the country wouldn't collapse. I know. In Ukraine, the collapse of the Yanukovych regime occurred very quickly and without warning. He fled. He took off. And the Russians moved their forces, the little green men, into Crimea, or out of their bases, into Crimea and took over within days. The Ukrainian, the new Ukrainian government was barely able to function. They were just finding their offices. There was not time to react. The, after the Russo-Georgian War, the Bush administration ended, right? That was in 2008. The Obama administration came in, and we were in the territory of the reset with Russia. I'm not doing this to, ex to defend or criticize. I'm just giving you, I'm trying to answer your question historically, like what actually happened. And the Obama administration tried to deal with Russia 
on a constructive basis and also failed. So the question is, will the Trump administration learn from the failure of the Obama administration and the Bush administration and not make the same mistakes? Now that's a good question. I would say this, the Trump administration has confirmed the Warsaw summit decisions for troops, NATO troops and US troops in Poland, the Baltic states and Romania. As a Georgian, you, say, you might say, what about us? I have some sympathy for that position. But I would say this, the rest of Georgia, unoccupied Georgia, is still free. The Russians probably expected Georgia to collapse after the war, and you didn't, which means you're still alive, which means there is still hope. And one of the things we need to do is to prevent the Russians from conquering more countries and resist it and prepare additional sanctions. My last job in government before I retired last April was the sanctions coordinator for the State Department and I had the, um, it fell to me to negotiate the sanctions against Russia after the invasion of, of Ukraine. The Russians know that we and the Europeans had prepared additional sanctions if they resumed their aggression in a major way. Hopefully the Trump administration will not let that preparation go to waste. So we have something to work with. And that's what I would advise the Georgian government and what I've said to them. Now, there we are, your country is still alive. And we all have work to do. I, probably not satisfactory answer, but then again, it's not a satisfactory situation. But it could be worse. Georgia is still alive. Hello, Roman Gajurka, University of Warsaw. Actually, I'm from um, Belarus. And I have two controversial questions. Uh, the first, uh, what do you think? Is there any difference between patriotism and nationalism? Yeah. And uh, the second one, on this conference we speak a lot about uh, democracy. Don't you think that populism is a main threat to democracy? Now we see a lot of populism in modern politics, a lot of radical and simplistic propositions to solve difficult problems, economic or uh, demo demographic one. Now we limit voting rights to people older than uh, 80 years old, right? Don't, uh, what do you think uh, about limitation of voting rights on the basis of education census, for example? Or do you see any other ways to deal with populism in politics? Thank um, you. All right. Patriotism versus nationalism. Um, mm. Okay. In the Western tradition, Aristotle teaches us that each virtue has its corresponding vice. Right? Courage has the corresponding vice of recklessness. Um, ambition has the corresponding vice of greed. Patriotism and nationalism are the plus and minus of the same thing. But Aristotle teaches us to focus on the good half and not the bad half. Patriotism is love of country. I guess nationalism means elevation of the nation above all other ver values. And that is not in the Western tradition. It's easier to express that principle than it is to carry it out in practice. Populism. Populism is a dirty word. It usually means demagoguery. 
But I would like to find a way to capture the positive side of populism, which means, I suppose, addressing the needs of people. Populism, properly understood, means a state of the rule of law, because people's needs will not be met if there is mass lawlessness or massive state-sponsored corruption or if institutions are weak. That's not populism, it's demagoguery. How this works out in individual countries is up to individual countries. But I don't want to surrender the notions of helping ordinary people live better lives. That's not easy. But I think defining, I think it is the job of politicians to create a popular mandate for those values, like the rule of law. I admire Mac, uh, Macron, President Macron's political campaign. And I contrast it with the campaign of Theresa May. She ran a cautious campaign, accepting the premise of the Brexit argument and softening the rough edges. Macron challenged French negative populism right up front, in their face, aggressively. He spoke in favor of Europe and he won, which shows that a bold, even populist campaign does not have to be anti-liberal in the proper sense. Each nation is different. I understand that. But I, I think the, the right job for a politician is to capture political support for a good agenda. And if, you're not, if you don't want to do that, why are you in politics? But easy to say, I'm not in politics. I've, just, I've spent my career advising politicians. Anyway, the, it's up to all of us also who serve in government or advise govern, governments to find ways to translate a politician's political interest into the best possible policies. That, that's a task for, for any of you who are going into government in the future. I'm uh, sorry for taking the floor for the third time, but maybe there's nothing else that, that want to take the uh, floor. Um, there's a topic for all the polls, and uh, many of us are taking, besides uh, all of students here in, on international relations and students of, uh, of uh, political sciences, uh, free seas initiative. Yeah. Yes? And uh, is it a serious initiative for you, or this is just a rhetoric thing, or is there any chance that Free Seas Initiative will be some kind of alternative for uh, Russian and German cooperative in economics? Well, the Free Seas Initiative, uh, like the the. I'm now working with the Atlantic Council, and so, um, full disclosure, uh, the Atlantic Council supports and helped conceptualize the Three Seas Initiative working with the Polish and Croatian governments. So the Three Seas Initiatives deals with three pieces necessary to build Europe whole free and at peace. That is, energy independence and a network of pipelines to weaken Russian energy leverage over this part of the Europe, um, transportation infrastructure, 
It, it all goes east-west, and it should also be north-south. And um, communications, internet connectivity. Now, those are worthy objectives. But those are also practical objectives. If the Three Seas Initiatives is seen as some kind of political construct to weaken the European Union, it will fail. That's not an idea that, that seems to me is worth pursuing. That is, why would Poland want to weaken the European Union in favor of countries between Germany and Russia? Historically, that doesn't work out very well. It does make sense, the Three Seas Initiative does make sense if it works with the European Union, with the Commission, and with international and with business and banking to thicken the infrastructure of this part of the world to erase the difference between Europe east of Stalin's line and west of Stalin's line. That is a worthy objective. But it should be an objective in the name of an undivided Europe in an undivided West. So that's my understanding of the Three Seas Initiative. And as such, that is something I certainly support. And look, congratulations to Poland. It, you know, you got Donald Trump to a mini meeting of the Three Seas Summit. Um, but it, to work, it needs to be seen as also pro-European which is not impossible to do. It's not that even that hard, but that's, that's the one cautionary note I would make. And then push it. Great. OK. Dan, thank you very much. Thank you, Jim Well. For four days, uh, we've had something like 27 different meetings. The topics were all over the place. Uh, we talked a lot about security. We talked a lot about international politics. Uh, we explored things like whether Gazprom is being used as a political tool. Uh, we looked at uh, young people and their attitudes in Ukraine. Um, the number of topics that we covered is actually quite large. The best of those uh, essays, the best of those presentations will wind up being published in something called the Warsaw East European Review, which, believe it or not, we, we published this on Monday. Today is Thursday, and it's almost out of print. So um, to be sure, we didn't print 50,000 copies, but still, uh, it's... Uh, uh, gotten to be quite popular, and uh, we expect that next year we're going to have uh, another uh, very good edition of this for students to take with them. You can pick one up on your way out if you haven't uh, had one already. Um, I suspect that uh, the team that put this conference together is probably almost as worn out as we are. Uh, and now is probably a very good time to thank everybody for, uh, for coming for participating in uh, lectures that may not always be your particular cup of tea. So I know that there are students who are in different fields of study for whom uh, some of the things that we talked about are in left field. Well, that's okay. That helps you to become something of a Renaissance person. The more you know about the world, even if it's not in your particular field of interest, the better off you are. Uh, I would like to think that uh, this conference gave everybody something to think about. Uh, we're already planning for next year's uh, meeting. And in the meantime, uh, I wish everybody uh, would come to our reception, which is taking place just as soon as I finish. Uh, and I would like to declare this conference closed. Thank you very much.